No, I'm sorry, that's good. Okay, are you sure, James? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the good one.
as it, once it gets audited as a basis to determine to close out the contract. And there's a um, final vouchers must be submitted in accordance with 52216-7. We'll talk a bit more later on about what is needed for that. You are responsible for preparing and submitting claims for reimbursement in accordance with your terms and conditions of your contract. Vouchers should not be submitted more than once every two weeks. Uh, Habit vouchers claim for reimbursement must be prepared on the prescribed government forms. Um, we'll go through we'll give you examples on the 1034 and 1035. So you can do that. Um, we also have the um, instructions on how to fill them out, and we also gave an instructions that go with it. It's actually right out of the information for contractors. Okay. Right. So we thought we would just print it out. So okay. I think they're in the presentation already. Oh, is there a link? Yeah. They're yeah. just um, the they're ones that they're kind of hard to read. So that's why we print off some clearer ones that was on yeah. that. We always get a lot of questions like, how do we pick which vouchers we want to come and do an actual voucher review? Or do the tools? You want to do the tools? Yeah, I'll do, the, I'll do I'll talk about how they're selected and then I'll talk about what we do. Okay. You want to pass it out yet? Yeah, you can pass it out. Okay. So, we have some general guidelines to go by, and, and it depends upon the adequacy of your accounting system or if we believe there's risk. Um, what I'm passing out here in this matrix is um, we have two, two ways we select them. One is just um, like a sampling parameter, like every 12th voucher or every 10th voucher, depending on the number of vouchers you submit. And the other one criteria we have is a high dollar. And by default, um, the high dollar is your average voucher plus 25%. But we found that sometimes if that 
kicks out a lot of vouchers. So, and the in the field offices, we've been going and looking and looking at that data behind that. So, and I know I have some contractors where I actually I establish a high dollar by contract because some contracts go really high, some are really low. So I was getting every voucher for some of these contracts, and you know our intent isn't to get every voucher. Our intent is it's risk based. So. For instance, let me go over this chart. So that's the high dollar. And then I'll talk about, let me finish the high dollar. So for the high dollar is, you know, by default it's, you know, the average plus 25%. But sometimes that doesn't always, like if you have a two or three dollar or four dollar voucher in there and then, you know, that gets the same weight as like, you know, a $25,000 voucher, you know, it's not really equitable. So like I said, a lot of field offices are going and looking at that data behind there to see is that a good you know percentage or you know good at average high dollar to use um, and you know we found some are spot on they're fine and we found others that you know we continually adjust and we review that on an annual basis um, and then the other part of it is just a random selection so and it's based upon annually how many vouchers you submitted and then you know, for a contractor that we have no significant risk with, no significant concerns, this would be like if you submitted between one and 12 vouchers, we would say 10%. So somewhere between one, you know, well, one and one in this case. But let's look at, you know, say that you submit between 500 and 1,000. Well, we're going to look at 4% as our parameter that these were established by our headquarters. So we're going to look at at least 20 and up to 40. So we say we're going to look at them. Are we doing the assessment tool? Or are we the doing assessment actual, tool. We're not doing an actual voucher review where we're coming. No. no. So that's the post payment. Yeah. So what happens is when you submit these into white area workflow, these parameters are in there, and white area workflow, or IRAT, will, will send us a notification that says, hey, DCA, you have these vouchers out there. Now the rest of the vouchers that aren't selected will go through for processing and submitted for direct payment and I know some of you may be familiar with they used to have um, we used to do the direct billing audits you know direct billing the authorization direct for direct billing has gone away it's been replaced with this which is a risk-based approach so obviously if we have a contractor that we have concerns with the accounting system or so forth where you know they look at a hundred percent of the vouchers um, it you know it just depends so when I say look at vouchers you're like well DCA, what do you do? Well, when you start billing on a, a public voucher, we'll probably contact you and send you a letter that says, hey, when you submit your vouchers, can you please attach these items? Because when you attach them, then we don't have to call you, ask for them, because we have to review this information before we approve the voucher. So if we don't get the supporting documentation, we have to reject the voucher. So I'm gonna go through the public voucher assessment tool that we have to which we provided to you, uh, I'll check it out, uh, which tells you kind of what, what is our process and what do we go through, uh, what do we, when one of these vouchers gets selected, you know, what does CCA do? And we turn these around in like five days, five, six days from when they come in. You know, we're supposed to turn them around in five days, sometimes it's six, you know, if we're waiting on a piece of information, we're not gonna kick it, you know, we might wait till day, six or seven to kick it back if, you know, we, we don't hear from you, you know, so it doesn't have to get rejected and resubmitted and so forth. So some of the questions are very simple and other ones require a little bit more work. So the first one, does the voucher have the correct contract number and is the cage code and white area workflow correct? So we make sure that the contract, we pull up the contract in EDA and we say, Okay, is the correct cage code on in white area workflow? And when this talks about white area workflow, this talks about IRAP because it's all it's all part of white area workflow. So we just compare that information. Is the contract number right? Is the cage code correct? Um, do the contract number, voucher number, dollar amount on a voucher agree with the supporting documentation? So again, in IRAP, you'll upload your 1034, your 1035. Um, and we'll look at that and say, okay, the supporting documentation matches or it doesn't match. 
uh, and we'll make sure all that agrees. Make sure that like, you submitted the correct um, supporting documentation for the correct contract because you know we're all human. Sometimes we scan and then attach the wrong file. And then are the costs billed within the inc costs incurred within the period of performance? Um, and to modify to address certain circumstances such as contractor billing by contract line item to suit the specific needs of the ACO. So, for, or the FAO, I'm sorry. So for this, we're going to make sure that the co the costs are billed within the period of performance, which is outlined in the contract. And also, we might look to say, are they billed at the proper um, plan level or delivery order? Is there, you know, is there It, does it say that you know you should bill on these five CLINs and to make sure that they're, you're accumulating costs of, the, of those five CLINs? Uh, does the voucher include current and cumulative amount? So all the vouchers are supposed to include what you currently bill and then your cumulative amount. Is it free mathematical errors? We take your supporting data, we plug it in and plug and chug it into Excel or Use the calculator and check mark it. Make sure everything is uh, correct. And we contact the contracting officer or the contracting officer's representative, normally the ACO, and we say, hey, do you guys have any concerns that we need to be aware of before we approve this voucher? Um, and we coordinate with them routinely through these. Sometimes we call them on each voucher. Sometimes, you know, we have a system where, uh, in our branch, where we work hand in hand with DCMA, so they know to call us right away if they have a concern. So. But you know, we, we touch base with them before we approve vouchers. Are the costs and fee billed in accordance with the contract provisions as provided in the contract brief or contract document? You know, there's a 15% withhold requirement on fee. So some 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 contracting some contracts say you can bill up to the 85% and then you withhold, and some contracts say you have to withhold 15% throughout the process. Is that a forward comment? It is in FAR. Okay. It is it is a FAR require, and I can't remember the exact FAR reference on that. Um, but it's if it's not spelled out in the contract, then the decision is left to the ACO. So we we try to work those out with the ACO when it's not spelled out in the contract. Okay, you know, and make sure that the contractor knows you know what's expected of them. Yeah. Um, did they use the appropriate billing rates? So again, the provisional billing rates and apply them correctly. So it is for those provisional billing rates. So we're going to make sure that you use the correct provisional billing rate. So if we don't have issued a letter, but you guys put a submission together, we're going to make sure that the rates that you're billing match, you know, what you've submitted us to look at. Um, do the current cumulative job cost reconcile with the contractor's accounting system? So this is where you guys have to <laughs> attach some information. So we have to make sure that the costs that are under 1034 and 1035 are the costs accumulated in your accounting system. So normally what we'll see is a job cost ledger, GL detail, um, to show that like if you build 15,000 of direct material, here's the journal entries that make up that 15,000. If you build 10,000 of labor, here's how I came up with labor. We, sometimes labor isn't paid till after the bill, you know, after you bill the government. So, you know, but is there a spreadsheet that shows, you know, this person at this rate for this many hours? Because we do come in and actually audit these. Like these, we don't come out, we don't come out, we, we don't do anything, we don't look at the, you know, we just look at the data from the system. Unless we've never been to your location before, then we will come out for that first voucher and watch you run some of this information out of the system. So that's where you kind of have to put all that supporting documentation together. So usually like a job cost report, general ledger detail, and so forth for those direct costs. And then for a cost reimbursable contract, again, we make sure that the that what's being billed, the cumulative amount, is within what's funded um, and within the contract amount. And then this is where it talks about the fee withhold. Um, Again, 15% or $100,000, whichever is less of, of the fixed fee. Um, and then the following procedures apply to letter contracts or undefinitized contracts, which we rarely see. Is Again, is it 
is the voucher in accordance with the clause 52216-26. Um, labor hour contracts, um, if required, has the contractor withheld a percentage of billable costs not to exceed $50,000 for contract. So again, um, that would uh, withhold requirement. Our labor hours supported by accounting records. So again, we're going to come look to see if you have time to, you know, submit something, some yeah, report from sure. the system that supports those labor hours being billed. Are the rates billed in accordance with the negotiated rates in the contract? So we're going to make sure that those rates that are being billed are in the contract. So we do kind of like a desk review procedure of the voucher. And then we'll either approve or reject it, or accept or reject it. And then um, usually, if you have a rejected voucher coming, you usually know because we usually call you if we have, if we don't, if we don't can't figure something out or something doesn't look right. You know, I always tell my auditors, go ahead and give the contractor a call, make sure we're not missing something, and then, you know, through those dialogue, you know, we either realize we didn't. We didn't recognize something. We're like, we're okay. We're we're fine. Or the contractor's like, oh no, I don't have that. I didn't provide that. I got to put that together. Or I didn't understand the requirement, and then we reject it, and then they'll resubmit it. Correct format. So any questions about this? But it is new. It's newer. Um, we did review vouchers before. We did have these requirements to review them. We did review them, but we didn't fill this form out. So, because I used to re review and approve a lot of them, you know, but we would just, I just kind of had my own little documentation. We, and we actually upload this into White Air Workflow then, or into IRAP, so you can go back and you can see how I filled out the PVAP. We call it the PVAP in the date branch. So. We like acronyms, so. <laughs> That's all I got. All right. um. As we said, if we believe based on our assessment tool if, if the voucher is not adequate or if we will reject the voucher um, and return to you for explanation as to why we don't accept it for processing. Um, if there is some suspicion on some of the costs that there is in there, we will <coughs> put good um, reference to the unit of the questionable cost. Um, just kind of go what Joe Gary went um, for the prepayment review of the vouchers. We evaluate for compliance with contract terms and billing instructions. Reconcile the bill of costs to the accounting records. Um, verify the indirect rates are based on the established for visual billing rates. And then make sure you know the indirect rates are properly being um, accumulated along with math. You know, there's many contractors who don't add up properly. So. Sure. <laughs> It'll be off by a little bit. As auditors and trying to screen And also the accumulate costs. You know, make sure that matches up when your prior vouchers. All right, our post payments. Um, it is also our responsibility to verify timely payments to your vendors and subcontractors. Um, verify that the bill labor, material, and other direct costs to accounting records are in supporting documentation. Um, it's not required to submit all that documentation when you first submit your voucher, but you need to have it readily available for us. So um, if we do request it, it is there. And you can submit to us directly, or you can actually submit through one of your work for our IRAP. Also, please make sure you're also good monitoring your subcontracts in the court it's far 42.202-22. So as a prime, you are also responsible for your subs and the dollar amounts that they are submitting to you for payment because you are submitting that to us and certifying them you submit your voucher. For these post payment reviews, we'll actually do an audit. So we'll come out, um, right now we're in a three year cycle where we're trying to go to every contractor in a three year cycle. But after next year, we'll be doing every contractor every year. So we'll actually come out, look at, um, your invoices behind your general ledger, we'll look at your payment behind your general ledger, we'll look at your labor distribution. So this one is actually an audit. We don't issue a report, um, we issue a memo. But this is, we select post-payment voucher reviews, we select from the pre-payment vouchers that we looked at. So we just verify that you guys actually went, paid the costs, recorded on the books right, whereas we kind of just do 
like a, a reconciliation almost, you know, in the prepayment aspect. Yeah. Now we come to IRAP, which is probably, probably known as large area workflow. Um, IRAP is known as invoicing receipt acceptance and property transfer. Um, and it's part of the wide area workflow e-business suit. Contractors can submit documents, call factors, invoices for payments, and support documentation in IRAP. You can do it using three methods. There's an interactive web application, the electronic data inter interchange, EDI. Or you can do it through a secure file transfer protocol. I think doesn't DCA also help get them set up DCMA. on how to get them set up on how to submit the voucher as well. Mm -hmm. DCA. Mm -hmm. DCA. They uh, they have a focal point I think that will come out and walk you through the process. Make sure it's all set up in our system. Yes, I know. electronic record for all documents submitted and these documents are accessible over the web in one secure location. So if you want to go in and make sure that it was submitted, um, it also can look at what review process we are in, if we reviewed it, if we accepted it or rejected it. So you can kind of see where it's at. It's not like lost in limbo. So you can also see the process. It also provides to secure in all of the transactions. So you make sure all the information you submit is actually secure. What are the benefits for you guys to use the IRA? It allows electronic submissions of electronic submissions of the invoices. It gives you faster payments. I remember the old days they sent all those hard copies to the office. And sometimes we get boxes of supporting documentation in them. So by doing electronic, it makes it a lot faster for you to get um, payment. And also, like I said, you can see the document status of your invoice. It eliminates the lost or misplaced documents. And as I said, it's a secure transaction. And it also allows us to use information to our own office as well. Um, this is also a good benefit for Department of Defense. Um, electronic recording of inspection and acceptance of goods and services. So if you are finishing deliverables, um, it gives allow the DOD to approve that faster for you. Um, global accessibility of the documents. Improved data accuracy, um, electronic transaction processing and entitlement systems. Um, and you know, reduction of unmatched disbursements. Usually, by going electronic, you only get paid what you submitted versus errors that can happen by doing the hard copies. Um, it's processed real time, and like we said, it's secure. Um, IRAP was initiated to limit paper transactions from contract processing. DFARS does require the use of wider workflows or IRAP as a primary submission and processing of payment requests. Um, there's a little bit limited exceptions to the wider workflow or IRAP is commercial transportation, tri-care governments, and uh, wide commercial purchase cards. So basically all vouchers should be submitted through IRAP or uh, wider workflow. Unless you have a specific um, exception in your contract terms and conditions. Um, like I said, before we do the, uh, we also do that voucher sampling, which Jody's already talked about. Um, it replaces the direct bill program. Um, we can approve the interim voucher selected using sampling methodology that Jody's already. If final vouchers are sent to the ACO once um, you do submit for payment. So when if we have usually we're, we're probably 18 months behind on anchor calls, right? On average, I should say yes. So, so usually, usually um, a lot of the final vouchers will get processed a lot quicker. And uh, also one point I forgot to make is we look at all first vouchers. So every first voucher that comes across gets sent to us for review. So do we do the assessment tool for those then? Right? Yes. yes. We don't do an actual voucher review. We just do that. Right, the assessment tool. Yeah. Um, these are just some the um, websites for wire workflow. Um, we'll get a copy of this now. I have the slide available for this. So. But uh, 
uh, usually when these two comes out to do the training for you, they should be able to find information as well. Uh, that's just to help desk if you need it. Okay, so Right. When we do your electronic submission of all your interim vouchers, all vouchers should be submitted through wide area workflow or IRAP unless contract can require hard copy vouchers to be submitted. In IRAP, the cost voucher is the equivalent of the standard form 1034, which we gave you guys examples for, is that cover letter that goes on your vouchers. And data equivalent to this 1035 must be included as a separate electronic file, which we also gave the example which shows all of your cost elements and the current and cumulative days. Just make sure the batches are submitted within your terms and conditions of your payment instructions. And there is one workflow that does provide you training for completing a cost voucher invoice on that, their website. Um, these are just, um, if you want to go to the links to look at the examples we gave you of hard copies, you can go click on these, but um, the clearer versions is through the information for contractors. Um, um, the closure file is probably best to look at. Um, as we said, the final voucher is the last voucher to submit on the contract. A separate completion voucher will be submitted for each individual project or task order, for which a separate series of public vouchers has been submitted. So if you have different delivery orders on your contract, your, vouch your final voucher must be submitted based on each delivery order and not based on the overall contract. And FAR 52216-75 will give you more information. What are some common issues that we see on the vouchers? Uh, like we said, math errors, we can see a lot of those. Um, bill calls not allowed for the contract terms. A lot of times they don't realize that like some salary individuals are not required to submit overtime. Sometimes that must get approved through the ACO or PCO before you can submit that. Um, you use the wrong provisional billing rates. Uh, you can use last year's or you, it, you did an error, you didn't adjust your provisional billing rates to reflect your actuals properly. And if you can be spent your billings over your contract ceilings. That's why it's really important on your provisional billing rates to monitor them in case there are any major fluctuations throughout the year so you can make those proper adjustments. So when the end of the contract goes, it gets processed and you're trying to adjust your actuals, you know, you're like, oh crap, I'm over my billings already. So that's why it's, it's very highly, you know, we emphasize to monitor your provisional billing rates and where you think your actuals are going, uh, going to be by the end of the year. I'm going to add one more to that. Mm -hmm. um, something that a lot of the contracts that we're seeing awarded recently are being funded like a different CLIN for each year or materials on one and labor is on another CLIN. So tracking those costs by CLIN um, and making sure that the, you're billing against those CLINs, that's another big area where we've seen, especially when that first year ends and that second year begins, that's actually a new CLIN. So, you know, we are seeing and kicking back vouchers, you know, so it's important to understand how your contract's established. And I think this is something that has come recently where we see a lot more of the funding by year, whereas before it was, you know, CLIN 1 labor for a two-year performance period. Well, now it's CLIN 1 for the first year of the performance period and CLIN 2 maybe the second year. Again, every contract's different, but it's just something to be aware of that, you know, and we're seeing labor and material that are being funded separately. So, you know, just make sure you understand that CLIN breakdown, breakdown structure and those limitations in your contract. You know, it's not always just that top dollar amount cost and fee. So. And that's where your contract briefs help out a lot too, on, um, doing your briefs and having an allocate by the CLINs as well. All right, um, some frequently asked questions. Is there any general guidance for how contracts should be inputting information in wire workflow? Like, you know, example vouchers being rejected or not billed, with the proper acronym, um, when the bills at the contract are not being accepted. So, as I said, there is training at wire workflow. So that is a more detailed link for it. But it is available for you to review. And also, if you have any questions about your voucher, don't be, you know, you can contact us or DCMA um, to help you out. 
So I'm looking at this like more carefully. The 1035 one? Yeah, the 1035 okay. one. So I know that for my insurance, I, I get billed on a quarterly rate so that, so would this be my, because I, when I calculate my rates, I haven't, I look at how much it costs me for over a year to run for GNA, and I just take it all and then, and then average it. Is this a actual, what I incurred that month, or is that my? For your insurance, or just like, or uh, if I, so on this billing, my GNA, so uh -huh. is that my GNA that occurred that month, or just my? That should be average. based on what we approved as your provisional billing rate. Right? Okay. Yeah. This, this example fails to put percentages in, so I think that's, like, so the overhead is a provisional billing rate. So it's whatever the base is, and I think, uh, okay. Like whatever the base is, so it it would be the base. Would I calculate as the, the rate? yeah, and then, and then and times whatever it should be applied to. So okay. same with overhead, same with GNA. So yeah, it's not you never have that actual overhead or that actual GNA. It's always that provisional billing rate that you want to use for those indirect costs. That's why it's so important to get those established and. Mm -hmm. um, from the get-go. So you can project so. those quarterly, quarterly payments yeah. throughout the whole year to make the average provisional billing rate. So then let's say in July you find out your insurance is going to be significantly higher or significantly less. That would be an example of if that's a significant cost element in your overhead, like it's going to move your rate up or down, that's when you would say, call up and say, hey, DCAA, you know, or contract officer, you know, we have a significant change in our rate, you know, I we need to adjust our provisional billing rate. So, and again, that's up or down. So we want to make sure that there's not substantial over or underpayment. So. One other question. Yeah, you're closing out a, so when I close out a CLIN, my all my direct charge is labor. So I'm like stuck with, you know, going down to, to, to get that full amount, you know, say allocating you down to the minute. Is that, what is a good rounding? Or do you just go, you have this many hours and this many oh, minutes? I, I guess you should split by a half charge. hour or an hour. I, well, yeah, so that I'm not leaving, so that I can completely close, you know, charge to that. So are you doing timesheets? I'm doing timesheets. Uh -huh. And then I, I predict how much, when it gets close, I predict how many hours down to like to the minute that I have that's the money that's left. So when I fail to the prime, I can say, okay, and then that claim is not. So you bill like a, a two days in advance of before, like, say you bill on a Wednesday, but you're including calls to the, in the Friday? No, I, I, I predict, so like I, I have two claims that I can charge to. Okay. So close out that first one out completely. I said, say that, okay, this person has this many hours left on that uh, charge number. Okay. And I can do it down to the, you know, all the way down to like the minute. Say, but that doesn't, I don't, I never was this contract, when I was working under someone, I never had, you, they were said you had this many hours, so what's an acceptable rounding, so you can. I think it would be based upon your timekeeping system and also your agreement like with the prime. Like does the prime contract spell out that you should bill in quarter hour increments or half hour increments or full hour increments? Okay, yeah. So you're trying to say, you know, you're trying to say at the end of this billing, we have X, like based upon the dollars left, I have X number of hours left. Yes. So I think, you know, you would, that's something you would want to talk about with, I think, the prime. But also, it should correlate somehow with your timekeeping system. Like how, you know, how do you require your employees to keep their time? Like, like a DCAA, we're required to keep our time in quarter hour increments. So do you require them to do quarter hour or? Half hour, hour increments. You, you want know? to make sure what's in your system is going to match yeah. what you bill on that invoice to him, so it all matches as well. Yeah, it all matches, and it, I just haven't. There was no on this contract. There was no quarter. There's no like rounding for time increments. That, that at least I, I, I mean, I like the, the format of the of the spreadsheet doesn't allow you to put like a point two five. I I can, but. Okay. I was just wondering how do then I round so that otherwise I have like ten dollars or hundred dollars left on that or like you know, on the that plan. How do you close that? Also, if you say you're done but you have extra dollars left yeah. over, is it fixed price or is it 
call sign? You said the CNN, right? Uh, yeah. So that that would just be that would just like be money remaining on there, or you could bill like the quarter of an hour. You know, whatever the actuals are. So, you know, you have to have actual time charges to support it. Yeah. You know, up till that point. So you so, can't bill the extra hours if you can actually incur it. Like you could bill like say say they say you have a tenth of an hour left, like ten dollars or whatever. Yeah. You could bill the hour, but you would be limited to charge to that ten dollars. Okay. Like so, you could say I incurred an hour, but then you would have to say, you know, but I recognize that my limitation is, like, is this. Okay. okay. So. Except I'll take it. Yeah, yeah it was just like it was a minor okay, challenge. Okay, I think we should figure out some direction because I was going. I apologize. Well, no, you're good. It just it on our mind. All of us were thinking. Okay, she's talking about. Sometimes, yeah, but sometimes like they have to submit, they got to submit their timesheets. Like on on the Thursday, on the Wednesday or Thursday, when Fridays are closed out. You know, it just I thought it was going out there. All right. If information is incorrect on the voucher, can the contractor recall and correct the voucher, or does the contractor have to submit a new voucher? Contractor will not be able to recall and correct the following fields. You can't correct the contract number, the delivery order number, the cage code, the document type, the shipment number or date, an invoice number or date. If the contract number has been entered incorrectly, then you must submit a new invoice for that. And if you we recognize this, that. you can always call us and say, hey, I know it's wrong. Can you reject the voucher? We can get in there and reject the voucher and then they can go relatively, and they can go in. And, That's probably better than that. and sometimes they get routed to like the wrong office. Like I know we've had vouchers routed. You know, if you put in the wrong DODAC code, it won't route to like DCAA Dayton, which is cognizant. It might route to somewhere in California or something. But you know, we try to recognize those. But obviously, if you guys recognize that before we do, then just you know, get a hold of us. We can usually through you, look into the system, figure out where it goes, and contact somebody to reject it and get it straightened out. Um, what is the proper numbering sequence for vouchers? Um, it goes a book pass. The voucher number must begin with B, B, N, and be seven or eight characters in the format of A, 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 X, N, N, N or A-A-A-X-N-N-N-A. -N -N -A. a means for an alpha, the X is an alpha numeric, and N equals numeric. Sure. Yes. The A position is only used when you have a final voucher, and that will be C. Seems a little complicated, though. Also, for, if it's through an EBS voucher number, it must be seven or eight characters in the format of A-A-A-X-N-N-N. -N -N. The eighth position is only used for final vouchers and will be found. Different numbering sequences must be established for separate delivery orders against the same contract. That's it. Any questions? <laughs>